All right. Good morning, folks. Happy Tuesday. I hope everyone is having a good start to their week. Um, we're going to go ahead and before we get started today, so today we're going to be covering one and a half sections. So um, we'll see how far we get. Um, I think the next three sections, 12.2, 12.3, and 12.4, are topics that you've seen in pre-calc, so something that you've seen at some point along the road. Um, we are going to work through as much as we can today and tomorrow, um, and hopefully we'll have more time for the last section in this chapter, which is uh, section 12.5 and hopefully we'll have at least half of Thursday and a full day on Monday to go over that. Okay. Um, before we get into that content, I just wanted to say that the quiz fours have been graded. So thank you for your patience on that. I wanted to prioritize the exams uh, this past weekend because I knew those weighed more on your grade. Um, but across the board, I feel like the quiz fours were not so great. So I would make sure at some point between now and next Tuesday when we have our exam to go over that content, check over the answer key and make sure that um, you're feeling more confident than you demonstrated on that quiz, okay? Um, I understand that it's a lot of tight turnaround times between exams and quizzes and new content in summer school. Uh, that's just kind of how it rolls for summer school. So keep on going. I know you got this. Um, I know it's tiring, but you know if you keep working hard, I think you're going to find a lot of payoff for this. All right. Well, um, that's my spiel for this morning, and we're going to go ahead and get started on 12.2. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen so we can take a look at those notes together. All right, so here we are in section 12.2, all right? So 12.2 is called parabola. And so before we talk about parabolas, we're gonna review two things that I think are super important. The first thing is visualizing what a conic section is. And so I don't know about you guys, when I, but for me, when I first heard about like this word conic sections, um, I got really scared and I was like, oh, this sounds like it's gonna be hard. Um, and I don't think it was really until later that I realized a conic section literally means a section of a cone, okay? So conic sections is really, we're taking these double stacked cones and we're slicing them in certain ways, okay? And different ways that we slice will give us different shapes. So for example, if you take a cone and you cut it slight, uh, all the way through, but parallel to the base, you're gonna get a circle, okay? So like this cross section here is a circle. Now, if you take a slice of a cone and you've only go through one cone, but you happen to go through the base as well. All right, so slice goes through the base. Then what you're gonna end up with here is a section that looks like that. And that is a parabola. And if we go back to slicing all the way through one cone, but it doesn't go through the base and it's not parallel to the base, okay? So it's sort of like diagonal slice. Then what you're gonna end up with is an ellipse, okay? And another word for an ellipse is really that it's an oval. 
Okay, so it's not a circle, but it rather an oval. So it's longer in one direction than the other. And then the last conic section that we're gonna take a look at is the hyperbola. And the hyperbola comes through a slice that goes through both bases, okay? So you've got kind of a little parabola up here, and then you have another one down here. And so when we look at hyperbolas, they really have a pair of branches, whereas all the other ones only have one, okay? And so today our focus is going to be on our parabola, all right? So that's our focus for today. Um, whatever time we have left, we will start with the ellipse in the circle um, and then move on from there. Okay, so completing the square. That is the second thing that I want to make sure we are feeling super strong in, okay, before we move through this. And I know that we've seen completing the square when we were doing um, some of the older units, uh, specifically when we were doing 9.4 and we were looking at, uh, or 9.5, where we're looking at um, situations where we couldn't factor it so we couldn't use partial fraction decomposition but we could complete the square and turn it into some sort of trig substitution okay so we're going to use that same technique here um, so that we can take a look at our uh, completing the square as it applies to parabola equations so if we take a look at example one here i just have x squared plus 6x now, if I want to complete the square on this, I really want to think, all right, I'm going to take that 6, I'm going to divide it in half, I get 3, and then I'm going to square that 3, and I get 9. But if I add 9 there, I'm going to need to subtract 9 on the outside to balance those out. And so we could then condense this to say x plus 3 squared minus 9 if we wanted to complete the square, okay? Uh, any questions on that first example? All right. So let's go ahead and try the second one then, okay? So the second one is one that folks had already kind of started to ask questions about when we learned about completing the square the first time, which I really appreciate. And that was the question of what do we do with a coefficient when we're completing the square? And so I think one of the best strategies to do is still to say we're only going to group the first two. And we're only going to factor that coefficient out of the first two terms. Meaning my next line is going to look like 2 parentheses x squared minus 18x plus 80. So I don't factor a 2 out of the 80, okay? And then I can say, all right, minus 18, so half of negative 18 is 9, or negative 9, and then negative 9 squared gives me 81. Now, what do I subtract from the end here? Twice of 81, so 162. Yeah, we got to subtract not just 81, but 2 times 81. And so we're going to end up subtracting that 162. Excellent. So then we could condense this to say 2 x minus 9 squared. And then 80 minus 162 gives me negative 82. OK? All right. So. We're going to be using completing the square a lot in chapter 12. For parabolas, we're only going to need to complete the square one time in each problem, but for ellipses and hyperbolas and the rotation of axes, we're going to need to complete the square twice, not just one time, okay? So let's jump right in, all right? 
So some parabola basics, all right? So you've got a parabola. We usually think about parabolas as y equals x squared, okay? And that's fair. That's one way of describing a parabola. But another way to describe a parabola is to think about some characteristics about this. And so it turns out that every parabola has a vertex, okay? And that is either the lowest point or the highest point on a parabola. So either the maximum or the minimum, right? And that's a term that's familiar to us. Another term we might be familiar with is this being our axis. And usually we call this our axis of symmetry, might be how we've heard axis before, axis of symmetry. And so that's the line that if we fold the parabola over that line, we're going to be able to match the other side exactly, okay? So it turns out that a parabola is more than just y equals x squared, but more specifically, it is the set of points that are equidistant, okay, meaning that they're the same distance from the focus and the directrix, okay? So we can say a parabola is y equals x squared, but geometrically what that means, it is the set of points that are equidistant between a focus and a directrix, all right? So what is this focus and what is this directrix? The focus is gonna be some point in the interior of your parabola. Um, if you think about like one of those satellite microphone things that you might see at the sidelines of a sports game, the focus is where they hope all of the sound waves go through so that they can get the most sound out of that particular satellite, okay? So focus is on the interior of the parabola, whereas the directrix is a line that happens to be perpendicular to the axis of symmetry and it is on the outside of the parabola, okay? And so all of the points, like for example, this one is however many units from the directrix and it's the same number of units to the focus. And if we look at every single point on this blue curve, every single point will be the same distance from the directrix as it is to the focus. All right, so we're used to seeing parabolas that are either, are usually up and down. Up and down is what we see a lot in like algebra, algebra two, all of that. We see up and down parabolas, okay? And so what we have here is we have a vertex and we give that vertex the letters H comma K. And then we have along our axis of symmetry, our focus is again on the interior. And that coordinate we can say is H because it has the same X value as the vertex, but K plus P, meaning we're adding some number P. Now this P tells us the distance from the focus to the vertex. Okay, so P is our distance from the focus to the vertex. 
Now in this diagram, they don't show us our directrix, but our directrix would be on the outside of the parabola, okay? It would be perpendicular to the axis of symmetry. And we could say that this equation is going to be y equals k minus p, because it's below the vertex, okay? Now, at this point, by this point in your academic career, you've probably also seen sideways parabolas, okay? And sideways parabolas are ones that open left or they open right, but we still define, whoops, we still define the vertex as h comma k. That still remains the same. And we still have a focus, which is some point on the interior of the parabola. And this time, can someone explain to me why we're adding p to the x value and not to the y value? Because um, the distance is, is measured in through the x-axis. It's not going up and down, it's going vertical? Horizontally. Horizontal, my bad. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because we're moving the point to the side. And if we're moving the point to the side, why would we add it to the y value, right? That doesn't make sense. So that's why sometimes we add it to the y value if it's an up and down. But when it's a side to side parabola, we add it to the x value, okay? So we have this x, h plus p gets added to the x value. And in this case, our directrix is going to be going straight up and down like this with an equation of x equals h not plus p, but minus p because it's to the left of the vertex. And again, that direction, directrix should be perpendicular to your axis of symmetry. Okay. So that, in a nutshell, is what a parabola is visually, graphically, right? But what I've included below is a chart for those of you who are like, you know what, I really like equations. I like to be able to memorize like what I have to do. Do I add it? Do I subtract it? And so this is just a summary chart to kind of help you figure that out, okay? Now, for the up and down parabolas, So let's call this one A and this one B. So an up and down parabola is going to be of this form, okay? X minus H, the X part is squared, all right? Now in contrast, if you see the Y part is squared, that's going to give you a side to side parabola, okay? So x squared means up and down, y squared means right and left, all right? And that p still talks about how far it is from the vertex to the focus or from the vertex to the directrix. All right, so hopefully this sounds somewhat familiar to you. Um, and from there, we're going to jump into some equations and kind of get right into graphing and see where we end up. All right, so we've got example number one here. Okay, so I've got this equation, negative 2x squared plus 8x minus 4y minus 24 equals 0. And my goal is to identify the shape, identify how far the, the vertex is from the focus, or what is the p-value, um, where the vertex is, where the focus is, and where is the directrix, and then take all of that information and throw it on a graph. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation and we're going to start by completing the square. And the reason why we want to complete the square, and let me see if I can get this both on the same page, is because if I can complete the square, then I know where my vertex is. I know what 
number P is, and I'm going to be able to graph everything and find out where the focus is, where the vertex is, and where the directrix is, okay? So completing the square is really the key to getting this equation into a form that is easier to figure out how to graph it, okay? So I'm going to take this equation, I'm going to bring it down here, and as I rewrite it, I'm going to keep all of the terms with the x on one side, and I'm going to move all the other terms to the other side. So I'm going to have negative 2x squared plus 8x equals 4y plus 24. All right, now this term, that leading term has a coefficient. And so I'm gonna need to factor that out of both terms that have the x. So I'm gonna factor out a negative two. I'm gonna end up with x squared. And then I know I have a four x, but is it gonna be plus or minus four x? Minus. Excellent. It's going to be minus, okay? And the reason why is because when we distribute that back in, it better make that plus 8, okay? All right, now let's complete the square. x squared minus 4x, half of that squared will give me a plus 4. Now, on the left-hand side, I have negative 2 times 4, which gives me negative 8. So if I have a negative 8 that I added to the left side, what do I need to add to the right side? 8 plus 8. Yeah, please. No, minus eight, sorry. Yeah, we're gonna need to have whatever we do to one side, we need to do the other. So if we have a minus eight on the left side, we need a minus eight on the right hand side. Okay. Now from that, we can take this part, we can condense it into a perfect square. Negative two, x minus two squared equals 4y, and then 24 minus 8 is plus 16. Okay. All right, let's get rid of this coefficient. We're going to divide it to the other side. x minus 2 squared equals negative 2y minus 8. And then my last step here is I'm going to need to make the right-hand side look like a coefficient in front of y minus k. So I'm going to factor out this negative 2, and I'll be left with y plus 4. Okay. From here, we can tell where our vertex is. So our vertex is going to be 2 comma negative 4. Okay, so my vertex is going to be 2 comma negative 4. Now maybe let me write the equation up here, x minus 2 squared equals negative 2 y plus 4. So we can see this all on one screen without having to scroll back and forth. But that point, negative two, or two comma negative four, I can already throw on the graph. So I can go to two and go down to negative four and draw a point, and that's gonna be my vertex. Now, this is the first shape that we're relearning, and so we haven't learned any of the other ones. So we know kind of that we're going to be doing a parabola, right? But to make sure, like if you had a bunch of different equations like this, how would you know the difference? Well, it looks exactly like this standard equation. 
we have an x minus h squared equals 4py minus k. And because it looks like that form, we can say that this shape is a parabola. And is this parabola going to be opening right, left, or up, down? Up, down. Up, down. Good. How do you know that? Because the x side is squared. Good. And is it going to be opening up or opening down? Oh. Up. Now. Ah, what do we think? Up or down? Down. <laughs> it is going to be down. How do you know that? Because what that is minus. Yeah, this uh, but minus. B, B minus 2. Exactly. That minus sign means that we're going to be having a parabola that opens down. Okay. I think we're used to seeing the negative sign in front of the x squared, but in this case, it's going to be that 4p part that tells us is it up or down or right or left. Okay. Now, while we're here, let's find out how big p is. So I know that 4p equals negative 2 because 4p is in the place of negative 2. And so all I need to do is isolate p, and I get negative 1 half. OK? And it's OK for the p value to not be a whole number, all right? And so all that means is my vertex is going to be 1 half of a unit to the focus and 1 half of a unit to the directory. Now, since I know that this parabola opens down, do I add the, do I combine the negative one half with the two or the negative four? Combine it with your y value. Yeah, combine it with your y value. So we'll get two comma negative four minus one half or two comma negative nine halves. Professor, can you explain how, again, how do we know that the parabola is closing down? The negative two. Okay, thank you. If P is negative, it's gonna be opening down or to the left. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in here so I can draw this focus, but it should be at two comma negative four and a half. So it's pretty close to my vertex right there. Okay. Now my directrix is going to be a y equals, and in fact, it's going to be y equals the y value of my vertex plus that one half. And that will give me a directrix equation of y equals negative 7 halves. And so I get my directrix to be like right here. OK. Now, when you are graphing these, I want these points to be as exact as possible. Your vertex should have a coordinate, your focus should have a coordinate, your directrix better have an equation. If you write some nonsense like it's just negative seven halves, but you don't put a y equals or an x equals, no go. All right, you gotta tell me, is it a horizontal line or a vertical line? But beyond this, the rest of the diagram, we often just sketch. And so we just kind of sketch it in like something like this. OK? So as you're graphing these, the important features that I'm looking for are the vertex, the focus, and the directrix. And then knowing which direction it opens and that all of those are there. And then the actual parabola part, you can just kind of sketch it, OK? So let's zoom out a little bit so you can see the whole problem on one page. Uh, 
Um, the directrix you can certainly graph with the dashed line is fine. Okay, a lot of people use a dashed line because it's not actually part of the graph. Um, I don't know why I did a solid line today. I think I was just worried that the dotted line would look messy. I don't know. <laughs> All right, any questions on example number one? All right. So why don't you guys take a look at example number two, okay? Um, and see what you might wanna move around, but ultimately look to complete the square so that you can start to get an equation in the form where you can find the vertex, find the focus, find the directrix, and then again, the rest of it, you can just kind of sketch it, okay? So I'll give you a couple minutes to start completing that square, and then I'll show my work below, and then we'll kind of go from there. All right, so in completing the square here, I chose to move the 22 to the same side as the 2x. And so that left me with y squared plus 8y equals 2x minus 22. And then I went to complete the square on the left-hand side. And what that did was add a 16 to the left-hand side of my equation. So to keep the equation balanced, I added 16 to the right-hand side as well. I combined my like terms, so I got y plus 4 squared on the left, and then I got 2x minus 6 on the right. And then the last thing I did was factor out the 2 so that I could see exactly where the coordinates of my vertex are but also use that too to help me determine which way my parabola opens and what is the value of P. So let's write this equation again up here. Y plus four squared equals two X minus three. Okay, so help me out here. What's the coordinate of the vertex? Three, negative four. Three, comma, negative four. All right. And we could throw that right on our graph. And we got three, comma, negative four, which would be like right about there. Okay. Um, what do we get for the value of P here? One half. We do get one half good because 4p equals 2 and p equals one half. Excellent. Now we know it's a parabola. Is it facing up or down, left or right? And how do we know? Left or right because it's uh, y squared or y plus 4. Good. It's y squared, so it's going to be right or left. 
And anytime you have a positive value for P, that's going to be either up or to the right. Okay. All right. I don't know why I made my graph coordinates so big. I'm going to change a few things here. We're going to make this 10 and 10, just like a regular grid. Okay. Now let me go back and put in that vertex. So three comma negative four. All right. So three comma negative four and what do I do to find my focus? Add it to the x value, your p. Add it to the x value, good. So we're going to get a 3 plus 1 half, comma, negative 4, or 7 halves, comma, negative 4. All right, so that means it is going to be right here. All right, and last but not least, we have our directrix, and how do we find the equation for the directrix? Minus it from your x value. Mm -hmm. uh, and is it going to be x equals or y equals? Uh, y equals. X, x equal. It's going to be x equals, because we're going to have a vertical line, and vertical lines, every point on that line, has the same x value as every other point, okay? So three minus one half, which will give us um, x equals five halves as our directrix. And so let me zoom in a little bit here, but that's gonna give us a line kind of like this. And again, you can definitely use a dotted line I think I'm just regretting picking examples where the numbers are so small. <laughs> okay, but there's our directrix and then everything else you can just kind of sketch. Okay. There is our example number two. All right, any questions on graphing and completing the square and figuring out directions of a parabola? All right, let's move on. So our next flavor of question, these two that we're gonna look at here, are gonna be ones where you're given information about your parabola, and the goal is to write an equation for that parabola. And one thing that I find incredibly helpful, especially for those of you out there who are like very visual learners, I like to use that information to sketch a picture, and then from there I can usually write the equation. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. For number three, I realize that they give me a focus and a directrix. And so I'm gonna sketch out, I'm gonna sketch out an xy coordinate, all right? So we've got the x, we've got the y. All right, so my focus is gonna be at two comma zero, which we can say is maybe here. And then my directrix is at x equals negative 2, which is going to be here. All right. Now, my vertex has to be halfway in between those two points. So where's my vertex? Zero. 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 Yeah. So my vertex is going to be right here. Okay, and so I can even say my vertex is zero, zero, and use that when I'm to fill in some parts when I'm writing the equation. And based on where the directrix is and the focus is, is the parabola opening to the right or to the left? To the right. Perfect, it's opening to the right. Okay, now one last thing. How far is the vertex from the focus? Two 
is two units, right? So like from zero, zero to two, zero is two units. That means that T equals two. Like I literally just counted it from the graph, okay? Now, since I know this is a right left parabola, I know it's going to be of the form y minus k squared equals 4p x minus h. And so all I need to do is fill in the numbers I found from the graph. y minus 0 squared equals 4 times 2 x minus 0. Or if we clean that up, we get y squared equals 8x. Okay? And that's it. So all we're doing is using the information they gave us, sketching a picture, using our, what we know about counting and definitions about how far things are apart from each other, plugging those numbers into the general form of the equation, and simplifying. Okay? So let's try that with example number four, all right? Let's draw a diagram where we mark off the vertex and the directrix, and this time see if you can find out where the focus is. All right, I'm sure some of you have way neater and much more accurate diagrams than I have here, but I drew in my vertex and I found my directrix to be y equals five, which I know is a horizontal line. Now, maybe in order to find out where our focus is, someone could tell me how far is the directrix from the vertex? One, two. Two spaces. It's two spaces, right? So from the vertex to the directrix is two spaces. That means that my focus is going to be below my vertex, two spaces. And since I know that this orange vertex has a coordinate of negative two comma three, then I know that my focus has a coordinate of negative two comma one. And I can sketch in the rest of it if I want to, but I have all the information I need here, okay? It's a parabola that opens down, so I know I need x minus h squared equals four p y minus k. And I know my coordinate for the x value of the vertex is negative 2. So x minus negative 2 squared equals p is not 2, but it is 8. No. What is the p value? Yeah, it's going to be negative 2, okay? Negative because it's going down. And also, I need this to be negative so that I know the parabola is facing down, all right? So we really want to plug in 4 times a negative 2 here. And then y minus 3. And when we clean this all up, we're going to get x plus 2 squared equals negative 8 y minus 3. Okay. All right. So sometimes
sometimes you're going to have equations and you have to graph them. And sometimes you're going to have parts of the graph. And from there, you need to create an equation that goes with it. Okay. So being able to work both ways for this is definitely a strong thing. Okay. A uh, quick question. Yes, sir. What's up? So if you have, if you have your graph moving towards <laughs> negative y values or negative x values, your p will always have to end up negative in the equation. Yeah, that's a really good way to summarize that. Thank you. All right. So all of that is fine and good. Okay. And the reason why we relearn conic sections in Calc 2, you might be wondering that. You're like, well, you learn about it in, in pre-Calc. You probably didn't use it in Calc 1. And then it's randomly coming up in Calc 2. And the reason is you're going to be doing a lot of work with this in Calc 3. So being able to determine what the shape looks like, draw a quick sketch, have certain quote unquote, easy, nice values to work with is going to be something, a skill that will be very helpful when you get to Calc 3. Okay, so that's why we're talking about this section again. And so to kind of prepare for that, um, I wanted to take a look at one example, I think, one example of how we could use calculus and apply them to a parabola. Okay. So, Here's our example, our last example for 12.2. So given the functions x, uh, y squared minus 2x plus 6 equals 0 and x equals 5, the first step is to sketch a diagram of the two equations. Okay? So hopefully you look at this x equals 5 and you're able to say that that is going to be a vertical line at x equals 5. But then I also want us to see this, whoops, see this, and say, gosh, that kind of looks like a parabola. So maybe I should try moving, keeping the y squared on one side, move everything else to the other side so that I can get an idea of what this graph looks like. So we could say y squared equals 2x minus 6. OK, this is nice. I don't even have to complete the square. y squared equals 2x minus 3. OK. So where does that put the vertex for this parabola? 3, 0. Beautiful. 3, comma 0. And um, I don't know that I need any other parts of it yet. It doesn't say anything about the focus or the directrix. So for right now, I'm just going to sketch a parabola that has this vertex. Um, but maybe one thing that would also be important, which way does this parabola open? To the right. To the right. Perfect. And just to clarify earlier, a question someone had said, oh gosh, someone had said, how do you know that number in the front is positive? So that's going to either be up if it's an up and down one or right if it's a right left one. Okay, so now let's throw these two graphs and get the pictures down. All right, let's do parabola in pink, and we'll do this line in blue. OK, so I know that this parabola has a vertex at 3, 0, and I know that it opens to the right. And then I know that there's this vertical line at five. Okay, so this is x equals five. And so now I can see that there is a region that is actually bounded by the pink graph and the blue graph. 
Now, before we move on, I do want to write down a few of the coordinates here. Okay, so this coordinate is three comma zero. Um, what is this coordinate up here? Find that by setting the two equations equal to each other. You could, you could. You could also say, I know the x value. What's the x value of this point? Five. Five. And we could take five and plug it in there. Yeah. And so when you do that, you get five minus three, which is two. Two times two is four. Two. Exactly. Because y squared is four, so that y value is two. And if we were to do the same thing down here, we would get five comma negative two, okay? Um, now, one thing that I, I really appreciate about this class as a whole is that when we were doing all of those complicated trig subs, everyone was pretty on board with like, let's draw the triangle first so we get it out of the way and at the end, we just have to remember to substitute. And so similarly, when we do diagrams here, a lot of times I like to kind of label intersection points or important points. That way, later on, I don't have to worry so much about what the numbers are. I can just kind of figure out, you know, okay, I want to go from here to here. I already have my numbers and I'm good to go. Okay. All right. So that's part A. It says sketch a diagram of the two equations. Part B says find the area of the region bounded by the given equations. And so what we're gonna do is take a look at this diagram for a moment, okay? Now, when you were learning about area, um, sometimes you drew lines that went like this. That's a terrible color to use right now. Sometimes you drew lines that like went vertically like this, okay? And other times you actually drew lines that went horizontally. And that line drawing is actually a pretty important way to help you decide should you set up an integral using dy or should you set up an integral using dx? Okay, so in this case, let me erase the second set of lines I drew for a moment. These green lines that I have, the top curve of the green line is the pink equation. What's the bottom curve of the green line? The x-axis? That's the pink equation. No, all the way down, right? So it goes all the way down. And yeah, it goes all the way down to the same equation. So I have a top curve that is pink and I have a bottom curve that's pink. And so because the top and bottom curve are the same, I think this is not a good case necessarily for dx. So I'm gonna erase these green lines, okay? And instead, let's take a look at lines that go this way, horizontally. So when we look at these horizontal lines, the right curve is the blue curve, and the left curve is the pink curve. Now that's actually a really nice, um, place to be in where the right curve is the same for every single horizontal line you draw and the left curve is the same for every single horizontal line that you draw. When you get to a situation like this, that is a good time to say, all right, if I want to find the area, I actually want to do the integral of the right curve minus the left curve and I want to have a dy at the end. And my bounds are going to be y values, all right? So we usually say from c to d to get the y values. Uh, no, it does not have to do with the vertical line test. Okay, 
So from here, let's fill in our numbers. I have the integral for what is the lowest y value of that region that we're trying to find the area of. I know two. Yeah, it's going to be negative, negative two. two, right? So negative two goes down here, and the highest y value I see is a positive two. So I go to positive two. Now, another way to think about this, let me get rid of those lines again. Is to say, I start drawing these horizontal lines at negative two and I keep drawing them. And when do I stop? I stop when I get to two, okay? So that's how I know my bottom bound and my top bound. The right curve is the blue curve. So that's just going to be five is the equation. Minus the pink curve, OK? Now, this pink curve right now, an equation that we have for it looks like this, OK? So for right now, I'm just going to put in that whole thing. y squared minus 2y plus 6 equals 0. And then we have dy. OK? So all of this represents the right curve. I have a question. But, uh, can you let me finish this one? Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK, so one thing that we want to do, though, is we want to make sure that our curve is defined as the function of y, which means we need to take this and we need to solve for x. And then that's what's going to be in our equation, because we need everything in our integral to be with y's. We don't want to have any x's in there if we've already decided that we're going to have dy. OK, so let's solve that real quick. We end up with we end up with an integral from negative 2 to 2 of 5 minus, and let me solve that up here, y squared plus 6 equals 2y, or 2x. So x equals y squared over 2 plus 6 over 2, which is 3. So I'm going to put y squared over 2 plus 3 in for my right curve. All right, what was your question? Um, why are you using the primary function and not the one that we already conclude, like the uh, y squared equal to, and then parentheses, x minus 3. Why don't you use that? You could, but I think one of them is probably a little easier to solve for x than the other. Oh, OK. But it doesn't matter. Professor? Yes. Uh, I thought you said right minus left. Does it matter? Where yeah. it says right curve? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. sorry. Yes, it does matter. <laughs> okay, so we've got our integral here. Let's go ahead and simplify this in two ways. All right. Now, one thing that I hate doing is more work than I need to. So actually, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find the area of the top half, and then I'm going to double it. That's going to give me an equation where I have 2 times the integral from 0 to 2. All right, so I'm only going to find the integral of the top half, and then I'm going to double it. And then I get 5 minus 3, which gives me 2 minus y squared over 2 dy. And now this should be way easier than any of the integrals that we saw in chapter 9. All right, so our integral of 2 is 2y minus y squared over 2 is going to give us y cubed over 6, and plug in 2, and plug in 0. 
And so this is going to give us 2 times 4 minus 8 over 6. I'm not going to plug in the 0 because it's going to give me 0 anyway. And this will give me 8 minus 16 over 6 or 8 minus 8 thirds. Or let's see, 24 thirds minus 8 thirds gives me 16 thirds. Okay. Professor? So finding the area of this, you could use dy or dx, but usually one of them is going to be easier. Yes, Charmaine, what's up? Sorry, uh, I got lost where you went from um, where you said to do just half of it, like the taking the integral, like two times the integral of zero to two. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how you got there. Well, my graph looks like this, right? I got that. Mm -hmm. I've got this. So I'm just going to find the area of the top half. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to double it because it should be the same as the area of the bottom half. Right, but where did the five go? Five minus three. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the nice thing about this, especially when that halfway point is zero, is that when you plug in your bound of zero, it usually, not always, but usually either goes away or it makes it very easy to compute. So that's another handy trick to know about, you know, looking for that symmetry so that you can just do half of the work and then multiply by two at the end, okay? All right, so I know some of you were hoping that after Calc 1, you would never see area again, but, that's not the case. Okay, so last two parts for this question um, is for C and D. So what we're gonna do here is now we're gonna find the volume of the resulting solid, okay? Now again, I think for some of us, we're like, ooh, area and volume was something I just kind of didn't really learn in Calc 1 and hoped it would go away. Um, but if you are on the road to Calc 3, and I know not all of you are, but if you are on the road to Calc 3, Calc 3 is basically like Calc 1, except in three dimension. So everything is going to be like what we're doing here, like this visualizing, okay, revolving it around an axis, trying to imagine what it looks like. And it's a skill that you have to believe that you can learn, okay? So when I first learned this, maybe the first few times that I learned area and volume, I was like, I don't know, I'll just keep plugging it into these equations, hope I get it right. But I would really say that that wasn't the best way. And that maybe one thing to do here is embrace the discomfort and just practice visualizing it and drawing diagrams and making decisions, okay? So for part C, it says if the region is revolved around the y-axis, find the volume of the resulting solid. And so I'm going to go ahead and move this to the second page. Which, by the way, some of you are not finding that I left you enough room on the quizzes or on the tests and you're saying, see the next page for my work. And I really appreciate those notes uh, because if you don't leave those notes, sometimes I just don't see it in the middle of grading a whole bunch of things. Okay, so if you're doing that, great job. Thank you. Keep it up. Um, but let's start down here with part C where we're going to draw a diagram. Okay, so I'm going to have my x axis like I had before. I'm gonna have my y-axis like I had before. I have that pink parabola and I have that vertical line. And this time I'm gonna be revolving it around the y-axis, okay? And so sometimes you'll see instructors do like a little circle arrow thing, and that's just to tell you which axis they're revolving it around. 
Um, but one of the things that I find really helpful is if I'm revolving it around the axis, whatever my original picture was, I draw the reflection on the other side so I can start to imagine what this looks like. So I know on this side, I'm also going to have a parabola and then that vertical line. Okay. So we're going to end up with a situation where the figure is not going to be solid, but it's going to have a hole in the middle, okay? Um, and I know that because there's sort of this gap between the curve and the axis of revolution. Now, for this method, okay, and I don't know actually if I've done this yet, but I'm gonna go back to my Calc 1 notes and videos. I'm gonna post some review stuff on washer method versus disk method versus shell method. So if you're feeling totally lost, I will post those by the end of day today, and you can go back and look at those and, and hopefully get a little bit of a review on that, okay? Um, but, when I am determining washer versus shell, in this case, I'm going to show you washer method. And washer method means that whatever my axis of revolution is, I have to draw slices that are perpendicular to that axis of revolution. Like that orange line is perpendicular to my yellow axis of revolution. Okay. So for washer method, Here's sort of a general equation. You can say pi, the integral from A to B of your big radius squared minus your little radius squared dx, all right, if you're doing dx, or pi, the integral from C to D of big R squared minus little r squared dy. So if your axis of revolution is the x-axis, so axis of revolution is the x-axis, you're probably gonna use dx for washer method. On the flip side, if your axis of revolution is the y-axis, you're gonna use dy when you use the washer method. So since I have a vertical axis of revolution here, I'm going to use dy. So that's going to give me volume equals pi, the integral from negative two to two. So I can use a lot of the same stuff I used from area of, uh, no, of my big radius. Now my big radius is the function that has a greater distance from my axis of revolution. So is that the blue curve or the pink curve? The blue curve. The blue curve, good. So that's going to give us 5 as my big R, and then I need to square it because it's big R squared. Minus the one that is closer to my axis of revolution is my little r, and that one is the y squared over 2 uh, plus 3. and I'm going to have to square that. Okay. So that's the setup. All right, now we're going to go through, we're going to solve this, but the most important thing here is the setup. Got to get this set up right, otherwise your answer is going to come from I don't even know where. Okay. So from here, it's a lot of uh, brute mechanics. All right, so we're going to go from negative two to two, 5 squared becomes 25 minus, I'm going to have to FOIL this part out. So I'm going to get y to the fourth over 4. Uh, plus 3 halves y squared plus 3 halves y squared is 6 halves y squared. And then 3 times 3 gives me 9 dy. 
Now I'm going to use that idea of symmetry again. I'm going to change the bottom bound to zero and I'm going to put a two in front of the pi so that I can double the answer. So two pi, the integral from zero to two of, let's see, 25 minus nine is going to give me 16 minus y to the fourth over four and then minus three y squared dy. Now everything from here is just integrating using the power rule. So 16y minus y to the fifth over 20 minus y cubed and I'm going to plug in two and I'm going to plug in zero. All right, I got my two pi in the front. I'm going to plug in two, so I get 32 minus 32 over 20 minus two cubed is eight. And when I plug in zero, everything goes away anyway. So two pi times 32 minus eight gives me 24 minus 32 over 20, that reduces. Um, I can divide the top and bottom by four, and I'll get eight fifths. And this will give me uh, 24 times five, and then minus eight will give me 112 over five, or a final volume of 224 pi over five. Okay, so again, the actual integral is not that bad. You're going to just use a lot of power rules there, make sure that you combine like terms well, but it's really all about that setup. Okay. We're going to go ahead and do part D here before we go on break. Um, no, we don't need units for this unless it's in an application. All right, so part D. Part D says if the region is revolved around the x axis, find the volume of the resulting solid. So we're going to take that same volume, but we're going to revolve it around the x-axis this time. So I'm going to draw a diagram. And we've got this pink parabola. We've got this blue vertical line. And my axis of revolution is right there. And so in this situation, I'm going to show you shell method. And shell method, you can tell when the lines that you draw are parallel to your axis of revolution. So in general, shell method means you can choose one of two equations. Volume equals 2 pi, the integral from A to B of the radius times the height dx or volume equals two pi, the integral from C to D of the radius times the height dy, okay? Now, in this case, if you draw lines that are, if your axis of revolution is the x-axis, it's actually gonna be dy, and if you use an axis of revolution of the y-axis, then you'll actually be setting up your integral with dx, okay? Now, I'm gonna, again, showcase shell method because I wanna show us how to use it, but also because I want to keep my integral as easy as possible for myself. I wanna keep that y. So my volume here is gonna be two pi, the integral, 
from zero to two, okay? Because I'm just taking that top half and I'm revolving it. My radius is defined by a y value, okay? So that's one nice thing. If you have dy, your radius is going to be y, whereas if you have dx, your radius is going to be x. And then the height is going to be my right minus left that I had from the area. Okay, so this is the right curve minus the left curve to get the height of the shell. And so again, this setup piece is super, super crucial. This is what I'm checking for. I wanna make sure you've got the right setup um, and that you're not just kind of figuring out how to make the numbers work out, but you actually understand the setup, okay? All right, we've got y, we've got two minus y squared over two dy. And we're gonna distribute that y. So we get two y minus y cubed over two dy. And we're gonna take our integral. So this gives us y squared minus y to the fourth over eight. We're gonna plug in two and we're gonna plug in zero. That's going to give us 2 pi times 2 squared is 4 minus 16. 2 to the fourth is 16 over 8. And again, I visually plug in the zero, but I know it zeroes out, so I don't even write it. And this is going to give me 2 pi times 4 minus 2, or 2 pi times 2 or a volume of four pi, okay? So when we revolve them around different axes, we do not get the same answer. That's something that's really important to note here, okay? We got four pi for this answer, but we got 224 pi for the, uh, over five for the other answer. So when we're revolving, the axis of revolution will impact our answer. And so it's important that we set this up correctly um, because the actual integral is not super challenging, but the setup is really where we need to make sure we're very clear on that, okay? All right, so we're going to stop here. I know it's definitely late for our break, um, but we're going to stop here. This is the end of 12.2. Um, we're going to take a break until... Um, 10.58, so just before 11 o'clock, and we're going to see how far we can get in 12.3 today, okay? So I'm going to stop sharing my screen.